In this video, we'll talk about cache blocks, which are essentially blocks of bytes from main memory that are stored temporarily in the cache memory. We'll also talk about what it means for a cache hit to occur, or what cache misses are, and we'll talk about the eviction of blocks. We'll also get into a little detail about how the CPU interacts with the memory system uh, on the system bus. The block is the main unit of data transfer between the main memory and the CPU. Typically the block size is about 64 bytes as it is in the Intel Core i7 chip. Note that I'm saying 64 bytes and not 64 bits. The register size is 64 bits but the block size is much larger. So the idea is that the cache holds a small number of blocks, but these, we hope, are the frequently used blocks of data. The main memory holds a lot more blocks, and ideally these are blocks that we don't need quite as often. Now when the CPU wants something from memory, it has to ask the cache, and the cache may have that data in one of the blocks that it's storing, or it may not. If the cache doesn't have it, it will have to go to main memory and retrieve the block. If the CPU only wants a small amount of data, for example, if the CPU only wants one byte, then if that byte is located in one of the blocks that are cached, then that's great. The cache can return that byte immediately. However, if the CPU wants a byte that is not in the cache, then the cache will go to the main memory and get an entire block. So the cache will then keep all 64 of those bytes uh, in its memory. And that's generally a good idea because if the CPU wants one byte from a block, it's pretty likely that it will want other bytes from that same block. So that's why the system works well. We transfer data in large chunks all at once. We're transferring data in chunks of 64 bytes, which is great because those can be done much more efficiently than a lot of small transfers. Next, let's introduce these terms cache hit and cache miss. Let's say the CPU wants to read uh, some particular block. Uh, we'll talk about writes later, but let's just focus on reading data for now. Well, there are two possibilities. Either that block is in the cache or it is not. If it's in the cache, then we have a cache hit. Okay, the cache contains that block. This is a good thing because then uh, the cache can return that data directly to the CPU and it can do that fast. So that's a fast access. However, the cache may not contain the block, in which case we have a cache miss. And this is bad because it's going to require some additional time to get the data. Okay, so cache hits are fast, cache misses slow things down quite a bit. So if it's a miss, the cache has to get the block from main memory. So the CPU asks the cache for a particular block, and if that block is not among the blocks that are stored here, then the cache has to ask the main memory for that, and the main memory will then send that block to the cache, and the cache can then forward the data to the CPU. Now, if there's a cache miss, then the new block will be fetched from main memory, and the cache will then store that block. So the new block will be saved in the cache, and that's great because uh, the CPU may need to have other data from that block. It may need to access that block again in the near future, and so that block is now in the cache. But some other block had to be removed. The cache has a fixed amount of storage space, and so whenever a block is loaded from the main memory into the cache, some block has to be removed, and we call that eviction. So some block is chosen for eviction or, or replacement, and uh, that block will no longer be in the cache. So future requests 
for a block that has been loaded into the cache can be served from the cache once the block is stored in the cache. But we also have to deal with the problem of eviction and replacing cache blocks. Let me talk a little bit about how the CPU communicates with main memory. The communication is done over buses. And a bus is really nothing more than a set of wires, of parallel wires, that are carrying uh, data and control signals. And so I'm drawing the functional units, the CPU, the main memory, and maybe some other devices, uh, as rectangles here. And these green lines down below are just wires. Okay, This symbol here with a little slash and a number indicates that this line represents not just a single wire, but 64 parallel wires. So the idea here is that 64 bits can be transferred between the CPU and the main memory. We talked earlier about transferring uh, uh, blocks of 64 bytes. Well, that would require a lot more uh, lines. But in this particular example, I'm showing a CPU that can get 64 bits at a time from main memory. So the bus consists of several different components. One is the collection of lines that are the data uh, bus lines. And then we have the address lines. And then we have uh, some control signals here, some control lines. And I've shown two. One's called read and one's called write. And so in this particular example, it appears that our addresses are 48 bits in length. And our uh, data that's being transferred back is 64 bits. So what happens when the CPU wants to read from memory? Okay, so read and write are a little bit uh, uh, ambiguous terms here. The CPU is reading um, and so it sends some stuff out and uh, it sends the address out and the data comes back. From the main memory's point of view, it's writing data onto the bus. So what for the CPU is a read might conceivably appear to the write, to, to the mem memory as a write operation. So I want to be clear that a read is transferring data from memory to the CPU. What happens when the CPU wants to read data? Well, it puts an address out onto the address lines. So it, the CPU drives these lines high and low according to the bits in the address. And it also drives the read request line high to indicate that it wants to do a read. Now I've shown just one memory component here on the bus, but there might be several different banks of memory. And I've also shown other devices. Here I'm talking about I.O. devices, which also sit on the bus. And so all of these devices are looking at the address lines. So you can see the address lines flow into the memory and the other devices. And when a read request occurs, all of the devices that are sitting on the bus see that and they check the address lines to see if it's one of the addresses that they contain. So main memory is mapped into certain addresses. The other I.O. devices are mapped into other addresses. So the other devices are mapped into different addresses and that's called memory mapped I.O. When the memory sees the address uh, that's part of, that it is supposed to take care of, and a read request, then it responds by putting the data from that uh, memory location out onto the data lines and that data flows back and the CPU then collects that data. In the case of a write where the CPU wants to send data to the memory, the CPU puts an address out. It also puts the data that it wants to write out at the same time on the data lines and it drives the write control line high. The memory sees the address, it sees it's a write command, so it picks up the data off of that, uh, off of the data lines, and it stores it in its memory. Here I've just shown two control lines, the read and the write. Uh, in reality, things are a bit more complex. Uh, there may be some lines that are carrying the clock pulses. There may be also some lines that are controlling for the synchronization 
and this, these are used when there are multiple devices trying to control the bus. In this simple model here, only a single device, the CPU, controls the bus, and other devices are essentially slaves and passive, and they just wait for the control lines to tell them when to do something. Here I've shown the same system with a cache added. The cache acts like a main memory from the CPU's point of view, and it acts a little bit like a CPU from the main memory's point of view. The CPU doesn't know whether it's communicating with the cache or with the main memory. Okay, and it, you, could, you might imagine that it thinks it's talking to the main memory directly. It sends out address line information. It sends out a command on the read or write line. And uh, if it's a read operation, then it expects whoever it's talking to to supply the data back after a certain amount of delay time. The main memory doesn't know that it's talking to the cache. It thinks it's talking to the CPU. So the cache basically acts like a CPU and it can send address and read and write commands to the main memory, which then uh, can supply data in the case of a read or accept data in the case of a write. So the, the cache can be added in the middle of this situation and from the CPU's point of view, it looks like a memory, and from memory's point of view, it looks like a CPU.